upgraded and Yeah, it looks like the screen's just black. I don't see them. Yeah, I could hear like the background music, I think. Yeah, it looks like the screen's just black. Sorry about this, you guys. Oh, there we go. Okay. Got it. All right, sorry about that for the technical difficulties, everybody. Give me just a moment, and there we go. Welcome, everybody, to Workflow Wednesday. Um, I, I goofed and didn't have the appropriate uh, scene up. That's why everybody was seeing a black screen for just a moment there, because that's all I was broadcasting. <laughs> So, apologize for that. Thank go. you guys for bearing okay. with us for a minute. So, welcome everybody to Workflow Wednesday. We have uh, right, with us today. Um, actually, I think you guys are all here in the YouTube and... video too. There we go. Because I'm a goof. Yeah. There we go. Um, sorry about that. Jeez, thank you guys for dealing with a bit of those technical difficulties. We have uh, with us Daniel Hashimoto, action movie dad. I'm really excited for this one because um, I've, I've I've seen some of your content from many many years ago. And so this is kind of a really cool thing for me. And uh, w joining us as well is um, Eric Brown, uh, our marketing manager. And uh, he's going to help kind of keep things moving and have some questions and help things go along. So um, just in case uh, anybody doesn't already know, um, Daniel, go ahead and introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and, and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, hi, I'm Daniel Hashimoto. Um, I'm, I go by Hashi, and I'm sometimes known as Action Movie Dad on uh twitter and uh around um but uh yeah i do a combination of things i do these videos uh with my kids where they where i integrate visual effects to do this crazy series called action movie kids and i also teach long form tutorials for red giant oh cool which is now merged with uh maxon actually right so, right yeah that was bigger a big all the time deal. <laughs> well, that's cool. Thank you for for taking some time out of your day to to join us for this. I'm I'm really excited. Um, like I said before, I've I remember some of the early stuff uh, that I remember seeing was um, I was thinking about this earlier that uh, the floor is lava, well, um, <laughs> and and then there was like a, a playground boat in a in a big storm. Some stock. Oh, yeah. I remember that being <laughs> a, a kind of a point of of stock footage, uh, kind of uh -huh. highlighting some of the benefits of that, and that was really interesting. So oh, yeah, thank really you. <laughs> um, I'm curious. So. You've been doing this for years um, on the the action movie kid and dad side. Um, what? How did that get started? I'm I'm really curious about that. Sure. So yeah, I've told the story uh, a few times. <laughs> so yeah, if you, if you heard it before, I'll repeat myself. But um, basically, um, action movie kid came out of an extension of what I used to do in junior high and high school. Um, I've been using the program After Effects since uh, version 3.1, I think which was back in 2001-ish, something like that, maybe oh, even wow. before that, actually. Oh, before that, because uh, I graduated in 2001, so uh, a while back. But um, in high school, I used to make videos with my friends. We would try to integrate these like fun lightsabers and effects and things like that. And uh, as I moved into the professional world, I got a real daytime job with insurance and things like that and was doing all that kind of business. But then uh, once I had a kid, 
many of my friends were sharing their home videos on Facebook and the like. And so I wanted to do the same, but I also didn't want to be just like all of my friends sharing the same boring kinds of videos. So I thought that I would show videos of me putting my son in danger <laughs> in crazy situations. And that eventually evolved into a YouTube channel because my parents were not on Facebook. I started posting them on YouTube and emailing them individual links. And then um, Reddit um, did their Reddit thing where someone shared a GIF from one of those that made it to the front page. Some people knew where it came from and started sharing that. And in one day, the YouTube channel went viral and got a million views and had all these uh, silly things kind of jump out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. In a way. I love it. That's really cool. Oh, so how did you how did so i know now you kind of do or i, I did a little bit of poking around in, into some of the background and you do a bit of a freelance vfx work and and also um or at least that's what i've read and um and um oh i can't recall now the you also do kind of have like the nine to five vfx work um yeah so it was a kind of a mix of things when i started action movie kids i was working full-time at dreamworks animation okay i was doing um they always have these, there's always a need for 2D people there to do various things, things like the intros to the Kung Fu Panda movies or flashback sequences in other movies, intro sequences, credit sequences, things like that. So I was the head of the After Effects department there, which started as a department of one, meaning myself, until I um, was able to bring on up to 12 more people to work on different movies. A few of them are still there, really awesome. and. Um, uh, this is when action movie kids went viral and ended up becoming enough of a workload that I ended up retiring from DreamWorks to go into action movie kids stuff full time. Oh, and neat. so that was fun. And we spent three or four years doing action movie kid exclusively, which was a lot of fun um, in partnership with Maker Studios, which was owned by Disney at the time. So we kind of became a Disney joint for a while. We got to have a lot of like Star Wars and Lucasfilm uh, overlap because of that, which was really fun. And uh, then um, as that started to kind of wind down a little bit as uh, as things do, I started um, to really merge with uh, a longtime relationship I'd had with uh, people at Red Giant. Um, Aaron Rabinowitz and Seth Worley, who I had been big fans of, both their tutorials and their work online. We had gotten in communication, Seth had moved to LA and I was one of his first contacts here and uh, we all became fast friends and Red Giant for years have been saying, come do stuff with us. And uh, I, three or four years after they invited me, I finally accepted <laughs> and I'm uh, working part-time for them now. Oh, that's cool. Um, so you said you were, um, so you were like the head of an After Effects department there at DreamWorks, right? Yes. So how did, how did that come to be? Um, was that all self-taught? Did you go, did you go to like specifically school for that? So it was, after Effects for me was all, I'll, I'll say self-taught, but really what that means is that um, for After Effects, I think a lot of people have the same teachers, Aaron Rabinowitz and Andrew Kramer and um, Film Learning and um, Film Riot, a bunch of people have posted amazing tutorials, which became a tradition that I'm now a part of, which is fun. Um, but I learned After Effects by myself, just trying to figure out how to mimic movies and mimic effects and things like that. I had a freelance career through college. And then when DreamWorks was hiring, I took any job I could take there, um, starting with a PA in the story editorial department. And um, it was fun. I got to do like true grunt work and uh, run around and pin boards and set up for presentations kind of stuff. But um, one of the first things I wanted to do while I was there was help them digitize their pipeline, which at the time was uh, really bizarre. They used to, use a video camera, like a prosumer camera, and film 10 second clips of each of their storyboards, and then import those clips of video into an editorial bay to edit into the story reel, which I thought was absurd. Yeah, that seems a bit so I said, clunky. <laughs> <laughs> like, I promise you could just scan these images, they're still images, and you could do that. <laughs> um, and so yeah, while I was there, we converted the whole pipeline to digital, and I started doing more animatic style things 
um, at the studio and they became very useful. And eventually they hired me as a studio to be an artist on one of their films. And uh, it, was, it was for uh, Rise of the Guardians, uh, which let's see. Yeah, I think it became yeah. Rise of the Guardians. And uh, yeah, that was my first movie as an artist, which was really fun. Oh, that's so, neat. Uh, that's super cool. Yeah, it, the department basically evolved from there. Um, it was just me doing this After Effects work. And I worked with my wife, uh, who I met at DreamWorks, Mandy. She's really awesome. And uh, she would prep images for me. I would animate them, and we would put them together. We did the first assembly of the Rise of the Guardians movie two or three years before it came out, which was very different, of course, than uh, once it eventually did come out. But it was really fun to work on things like that. And so, uh, yeah, the position just evolved, and the need for that kind of position became more and more, and we would bring on more people, people who would help outside the studio from uh, Ken Duncan Studios, who did uh, the animatic sequences on Kung Fu Panda 1, and uh, slowly more and more 2D people who could do uh, ink and paint and uh, lots of cool things like that for some of their TV specials. And then, uh, yeah, it was a pretty cool little, little shop. Oh, that's neat. That's cool. So I uh, do have a, a question from from our audience. Um, how did you come across doing the Kubo and the two strings intro? Oh, um, so uh, that came about because I was office mates with Shannon Tyndall. Um, this is during Rise of the Guardians. Um, Shannon was the person who uh, wrote Kubo and the two strings based on some stories of his wife and uh, her relationship with her mother, which is pretty cool. So. I kind of knew him all through the um, genesis of that show. Um, brilliant guy. And um, yeah, he ended up uh, moving from DreamWorks over to Leica, heading up that project. And as a kind of a pitch reeler to kick off that project at Leica, he really wanted a storyboarded first sequence. And he wanted it to be really impressive and give an idea of what the movie would be like. And uh, yeah, I was really proud. the The final piece ended up being nearly shot for shot what they reproduced in the movie. So oh, cool. it was pretty incredible to know that his vision was that uh, airtight all the yeah. way from pitch to production. So oh wow, that is really cool. Um, so it's, it's, I'm, I imagine it's got to be really neat to see that kind of evolution. Um, to to know to kind of have your hands on from the very beginning of something and then kind of see it come to fruition out in, in theaters and things like that. Do you ever, do you ever kind of have like a, I'm not sure of the right word for it, but is it sure. kind of like mind blowing to kind of see the, it the is, final it, product? It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. And surreal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like my entire career at DreamWorks, I felt humbled and unqualified to be so cl working so closely with the talents that I was working with which was really neat. Um, when you work in animation, the director is so in touch with every department and what's going on that they felt really accessible, which is really neat. And not only that, but the directors would also be um, doing, you know, doing work as storyboard artists on other films or helping with, uh, with you know, punch up on other movies all at the same time. And so, yeah, being in a room with a small group of people trying to come up with a story for a movie and then eventually seeing the movie come out and know that some of them were ideas that came up in that room and uh, seeing which things could survive the crazy, you know, production hell uh, <laughs> scheme was always really exciting. But uh, yeah, seeing my, like, my name in a credits the first time was really exciting and uh, knowing that I helped put things on screen toward the end was a really rewarding uh, yeah. experience. So was a lot of a lot of the work you were doing more towards the, like the very beginning, kind of early production kind of kind of area. That is how my job began. It was oh. doing um, animatics and storyboard things to kind of sell ideas before they were in three D. And then when I went on to Rise of the Guardians, um, we started doing some more work with the VizDev paintings and integrating them into uh, the story reel, which was really cool. And that made me a natural fit for transitioning to the Kung Fu Panda movies where they were doing these, they wanted to do these Samurai Jack inspired um, 2D sequences at the beginning. And I consulted on the first one for a little while, which they ended up hiring a bunch of artists from Ken Duncan Studios to work on. And then for the second movie, Kung Fu Panda 2 was able to get me on and bring some of the Duncan artists over to work on the DreamWorks campus, which is really great. So that's how we kind of started doing 
uh, work that ended up on screen, which is really fun. And I did that for uh, both the Kung Fu Panda movies, some work on um, Home, I think, and then, um, yeah, uh, most lately on uh, Mary Poppins Returns. Oh, neat. That's cool. So not not just not just fully animated stuff then. That's really cool to know. Mm-hmm. Right on. We have we have another question I want to interject from uh, from the audience. This one's actually coming from Sir Wade Neidstadt himself. Um, he says, hey, how's it going, man? He says, hey, Hashi and Puget team. Uh, with everything new happening tech-wise, C4D, Red Giant, Mac, uh, Maximo, game engines, etc., is there anything specific you want to learn or do that wasn't possible, wasn't as possible before? Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's see. There are many things that I wish I could do uh, that I can't do right now. Um, some of the things that I'm just starting to be able to do and I'm really excited about um, from the After Effects, the Adobe and the After Effects side is I've been thrilled with Content Aware Fill and really thrilled with Rotobrush 2, especially after learning how to use Rotobrush 2 better than I ever knew how to use Rotobrush 1. I think I used to uh, I used to have a very bad process for working with a Rotobrush tool, but I did. I used it a lot, like brute forced it um, through a bunch of action movie kid videos. And recently, um, the Rotobrush tool, tool which uses machine learning is incredible since a lot of my business is separating foregrounds from backgrounds or even erasing them all together. So Adobe is doing some pretty cool things that I really like and are super helpful for my workflow. Um, I'm really excited to get more into Cinema 4D. And now that Maxon and Red Giant are merged, I have this wealth of experience and opportunity getting to learn um, how that works. Um, I'm fairly, I've been familiar with Cinema 4D for years. I've, it's always been my go-to 3D software, but it's always been kind of an intermediary. Like I would usually be using it just to like make sure something was right and then bring it into Element because I feel really comfortable inside After Effects. Um, yeah, I know Sir Wade has been trying out uh, some Blender and um, got incredibly far with that in a short amount of time, which is really cool. Um, yeah, I'm excited seeing the things that people are doing in Blender everywhere, but I also have a, uh, yeah, I have such a wealth of people who uh, know how to do everything in Cinema 4D that I'm going to try to learn as much of that as I can first. Oh, that's cool. I've been kind of blown away with what people have been doing with... Um like Unreal Engine and virtual, like virtual scene production. Um, oh yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, there's one clip that I keep uh, seeing where this, this gal kind of, it's like a, it's like a, it shows behind the scenes and then the actual like rendered scene. And this gal kind of walks forward and then rides. Oh, Ian Hubert's down. thing. That's, yeah. That's mind blowing. Cause like, if you didn't know, you'd think, man, they'd have to construct like this whole thing. And there's like a, you know, there'd have to be a, um, a dolly and whatnot to like follow her around, but she's just standing there. And I know. Um, and then there's another Cinna. Yeah, Ian is his own kind of genius. It's absurd. I have no idea how he works as quickly as he does. I have no idea how he he knows every facet of what he's doing, and it's right. really incredible. And then I'll, I'll see like his setup at in his you know home studio and stuff, and right. I'm just like, damn it, that guy's so good. It is. It's, <laughs> it's mind blowing. And then the stuff like combining it with. Um, like the Vive pieces and things, so uh-huh. you can get like the whole camera is actually moving three dimensionally in the in the space, and it's just it's mind blowing. It's so cool. I, I love seeing all. I mean, at some point, like you're saying, like a home studio, you're just gonna have like a one little room that's all just green, and you can do anything. It's amazing. So yeah, I mean, that's the. I think that maybe um, yeah, going back to the other question. Being able to render well in 3D is still something that I very much keep at an arm's length. Like I'm always rendering stuff to the best of my ability in Element inside After Effects, and I still haven't dipped my toes into Redshift or um, even natively rendering in Cinema 4D because I'm a little afraid that I'll mess something up. But uh, I think once I, uh, I once I take the leap, I'll uh, I'll get into that. Yeah, it'll be it'll be cool to see what just the future is. is very exciting i think it's it's always really exciting that's really cool um, so i'm kind of curious that you were talking um earlier about like picking up uh software packages kind of learning on your own like 20 years ago mm-hmm. um, and then you're still kind of doing the same thing now picking new things up and continuing to learn i'm kind of curious like what 
it's it sounds like some things have stayed the same like you know going to these uh certain people that are like still producing tutorial content and all like and, and stuff like that but like what's what's different between between now and then and like what advice do you have for people that are trying to like pick this stuff up right now oh sure um well one of the most amazing things is that youtube is so robust that if there's any specific thing you're trying to do and you just type it in it's really likely that someone whether super professionally or really amateur style has recorded themselves doing the thing that you want to do. And so one of the things that I like of this buffet of knowledge is that some people are really good at one thing, but they don't use it artistically per se. They just know how to do the thing that you don't know how to do. And some people will be really great artists, but they never dive into the details of how to do something really complex, which is sort of where I reside. I feel like I, I know how to do a really wide array of things, but I feel like I don't have some of the, uh, like they're like Andrew Kramer's got this insanely finely crafted artistic sensibility around him. And I sort of try to morph into whatever situation I'm in. I'm usually trying to, I'm a hack. I'm always trying to, uh, make something look like, uh, the other thing that you saw or whatever. So, um, sure. It's, uh, what's fun is, um, I think nowadays the wealth of online tutorials is so huge that I don't even know if I would advise people to try to pay for any kind of schooling to learn this stuff because um, reels were much more important to me when I was in a hiring position than the education or background or degrees they had. Um, aside from knowing that they could work in a professional environment or collaborate with other people, but um, Really, you know, the work uh, speaks for itself a lot of the time. And some people, yeah, like Ian is doing amazing work and is just a dude at home. <laughs> so um, it's amazing what uh, what you can learn to do in that kind of environment. Yeah. I've, I've found that to be true, too, as, as, as time goes on, that it's, it's less about, like, a piece of paper. It's more being able to prove and show that you know what you say you know. Um, mm -hmm. having like those yeah, those demo reels or portfolio and stuff yeah that's that's cool and i kind of like that it kind of takes um some pressure off of the the those people out there who may have a passion or maybe like later on in life and think oh man i, I can't i can't either afford the money or time to invest into proper education but if i take a couple hours out of every day i might i can totally just put some something together and follow a passion and, and really certainly make something of it. that's that's really cool yeah, I mean, time is the only thing. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, privileged saying, you know, like I, I have a nice computer to work on and things like that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can really get started. Um, most software packages have trial and educational versions, and all of YouTube is free, which is pretty amazing for all of these kind of tutorials. So it's a, uh, you can get as far as you can, spending as little as you can, just to try to get into it and find out if it's right for you. What has been, um, outside of maybe just kind of hacking together, learning, what, oh man, I want to try and do this thing, and so finding it, what else has kind of been um, troubling or, or, or difficult for you to in, in this whole journey of your, that you've gone on? Um, one of the biggest challenges I run up against every now and then is animation. <laughs> Um, when I was first, um, when Action Movie Kid was going viral and things like that were happening people were always saying dreamworks animator does all this stuff and so that so i became associated with dreamworks animators and i did every now and then animate something for them but i was not an animator by uh by any means um so character animation is this um thing that i've never known how to do and i'm always like every day trying to find out a cheat for some way that i can use motion capture or i can um utilize motion tracking or puppeting something to uh, to approximate something to avoid having to do any animation whenever I can. It's something that I'm not, whenever I've done it myself, it it, uh, it makes me cringe to look at. So uh, um, that's something that, you know, it's a it's an art outside of what I know how to do, but I can fake it sometimes. Sure, sure. Uh, have you dabbled with uh, Adobe Character Animator? I haven't yet. Um, I, I Every time I run into Adobe at, uh, trade shows and stuff i um it's the it's a piece of software of theirs that i would love to tackle next especially because i started my career wanting to be a puppeteer 
when I was, I mean, when I was 12 or something, but it evolved into this um, visual effects thing. So I'm still, you know, puppeteering things behind the scenes and putting my work over here while I hide it back here, but uh, very different form than uh, character puppeteering, sure. for example. But it was something that I was always really interested in. And I like the idea of being able to, yeah, use a performance to drive a 2D character or a stylized character or something like that. But uh, haven't taken the full plunge. I've watched tons of videos on it and just haven't uh, had the right project. Oh, okay, well, I see. That's that's cool though. Um, okay, so we do. We have another question from the audience. Um, Blake Rizzo's asks, uh, "What are some hey, projects that you are really excited to work on, if you can say?" All right. Um, let me think. The two projects I'm working on right now, I can't say anything about. Um, the honestly, the things that I'm getting the most jazzed about right now uh, is working at Red Giant and doing the next Cheap Tricks episode. The things that I like about that is, um, well, first of all, I get to like mimic some movie that's coming out, or I'll see a cool trailer, and we'll say like, "Oh yeah, let's do that effect from this thing." And there are a lot of people doing the same thing. But the freedom that Red Giant gives me, both with the amount of time to craft the tutorial and the, um, yeah, the resources to do things like get motion capture for a project or to film something in a green screen studio or work with um, Marta Svetek, who's our, she does everything for, uh, Red Giant on the Cheap Tricks production side. She'll wrangle studios and studio space and producers and actors and costumes and things like that and performs in half of them, which is amazing. Um, but it's just a really fun open box kind of experience where I feel like I'm doing what I'm best at and then getting paid to do it. And that feels really, really cool. Um, so I'm always excited for whatever the next one is because the topic changes all the time. So um, for someone with a short attention span, it's a lot better than like working three years on a Kung Fu Panda movie and, uh, you know, you have 20 shots and the, you know, you work on them for two years. And so you, you, by the end, you've, uh, you've done about all you can artistically to give to them. But for these quicker ones where you're trying to produce them in a month or something like that, uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I definitely need to work on short bursts of, uh, short bursts, high intensity, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask. Is like, what is the what does the cadence look like for um, for those uh, cheap tricks videos, and like like how frequently are you guys posting them, and then like what does that process look like from like ideation of saying like this is the one we want to target next, all the way to actually um, actually distributing it and, and putting it out there. Sure. Well, the biggest thing is usually just seeing whatever trailers you know just came out for movies that are coming kind of coming down. The pipeline. There's always, you know, some investment in trying to be timely with them, if possible, uh, trying to release them at the same time as people are, you know, search engine optimizing them. But um, for the most part, it's been just like, what is something we think we could do well? And also, since there are other people doing this, what is something that I can do where I can teach people another skill along with it? That's been really important to me is trying to not just do the specific effect of the tutorial. I always want people to really know this is why these tools work well for these effects and try to build them up from the ground up in case you don't know anything about fractals or you don't know anything about trap code products or something like that. I try to dive into one in a usually comprehensive and pretty bloated <laughs> form, but um, uh, they seem to be helpful to people, which is really great. And uh, yeah, the only drawback is I'll think like, shoot, I talked about this at length the other day. And I mean, it's just the same thing. They could just apply it, right? But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's always fun to try to adapt those. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, oh yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the process is basically they will get the idea then for what we'll do. And I work about three and a half days a week for Red Giant. And so during those three days, I'm, I'll either be tinkering with trying to do the effects at home or doing a temporary version of something and just exploring and figuring out what I can do, screen recording myself as I do in case it turns out well. And then um, after that, I usually write like a 20 page script that I record and kind of redo the tutorial after I've kind of done all the really long form version of it. I'll try to redo it all in a more comprehensive way and add little tidbits of knowledge along the way. And then uh, 
yeah, they probably take about a month to do. Like that was the that was the goal originally was about one of these a month. But uh, yeah, there are ebbs and flows, and sometimes I'm helping on this or that, or we're releasing a new product and we're pushing that or something like that. And uh, yeah, it gets a little bit off track. But uh, and I'm distractible, uh, <laughs> admittedly. <laughs> I can I can relate to that. I, I tend to get a little distracted myself in in with all the, everything that is going on. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a we have another question from the audience. This one actually comes from uh, our coworker Matt Bach. He asks um, so from his he says as someone who doesn't do VFX work, how do you decide when to do things practically versus doing it afterwards digitally? Hmm. I think it's a good. It's it it certainly depends per person. Um, I like I will fix anything in post, including things like my children's performances and eye lines, digitally because I know how to do that now. But for the most part, the headache that doing things digitally that could have been solved practically is usually huge, and I always recommend trying to solve things practically when you can. Um, for me, or like for anyone, it's really about what you have the most access to and ability to do. If you have the time to set up some fun game or stunts or sets or set pieces, anything like that, that you can bring into play and film in the camera, it's amazing. Um, because if that's where your passion lies, if you're a you know like if you're into crafting, if you're into costuming, you can get get amazing production value in front of a camera. If you're really into lighting and camera setups, you can make things that look like films because you know, like 80% of that is lighting more than quality. And um, yeah, I feel like you lean into whatever is the thing that you enjoy doing the most. I love once I finally have everything recorded and I have the video on my computer and I can start messing with it in After Effects because I know I can rip every little piece apart. I can erase any camera that appeared and said I can erase reflections and I can do all these crazy things. So I have these superpowers in the computer that I don't, that I clearly don't have when, like I don't realize the camera or the lighting is visible on set. So um, yeah, it's all about uh, figuring out what you like to do the most and really just you know, leaning into that and minimizing the part that you don't like doing, I guess. Yeah, sure. That, make, that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. Um, oh, I like this. There's another one from, from Twitch. Um, I'm gonna. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna butcher the the screen name, but I think it's Ropan Uganti. Uh, question. Hello. And he hopes I'm asking the right way. If there were a cheap tricks on an older movie, 1980s or earlier, uh, what would be your movie VFX pick to make a tutorial on? Ooh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, the hard part of answering that would be so much of the charm of 1980s 80s era movies is the amazing combination of practical and sometimes animated effects. Like I think of Back to the Future or something like that, where there are these amazing movies that involve tons of practical effects, lots of, you know, camera technology in scene kind of stuff that I just can't teach in the same way or show people how to do in the same way. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah, I love, I. I grew up with the same movies that a lot of people my age did, obviously. I love the Indiana Jones movies and Star Wars, the originals, and the um, just the way those movies impacted my life. Um, I don't know if one stands out that I would want to do a Cheap Tricks on, but um, I would certainly... I, I do believe that in Cheap Tricks we will start venturing into older movies um, like that to try to simulate things that you could do um, like even in the 90s when you no know, digital technology was first just getting integrated into film um that's sort of where a lot of prosumer people are starting out like you're dinker you know tinkering with putting digital things into your video for the first time and it's kind of cool because you know Jurassic Park got a lot of things perfectly right that stand up to the best stuff done today and they just you know relying on a few simple principles so that's a, that's a good example too because like it still blows my mind that the the scene where the t-rex is coming out of the paddock and it's nighttime i never knew that that was cg until it's i flawless. saw one of the vfx reacts and they say the, the the trick to that was because it's it's filmed at night and it and like the the rain and the kind of the 
it, you, it hides the CG because there's a previous scene where the, it's that wide angle shot of all the brachiosaurs and stuff, and that's clearly computer generated. But I, for decades, like literally like 15 years, <laughs> I thought that that was a practical thing, like a miniature, and they just had like a depth of field kind of thing. And so to know that that was all computer now is, is mind blowing. That's super cool. It's incredible. And that's another, um, like that shot is a good example of knowing that it was people unequipped to deal with this crazy challenge. So they had to think a lot about how they were going to do it. They had to think of the tricks of like the very few light sources that you'd have, like a simple, you know, like dark fill light and like one rim and a glossy dinosaur surface. And just knowing that filmically what it would look like is what they could produce in the computer. And uh, yeah, they just put a lot of work into it until it turned out beautifully. I mean, working with systems, they couldn't even preview the render <laughs> to any great degree until they were ready to commit to crazy calculations afterwards. So it's a, it's an amazing thing to know that when you're obsessed with something or <laughs> you really want to prove something, you sometimes do the best job that's ever done. Yeah. It, it's, it's remarkable how well that still stands up to this day. Like, it, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm, 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 I always do read the comments for Cheap Tricks episodes. So if as, as people have older movies, they would love to see effects from, always comment and like other ones that you see like that. And I definitely influence our uh, selection process. So well, That's good to know. Yeah. So if, if, you know, like, comment, and subscribe, all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I was curious about some of your own, like the action movie kid stuff. How how much of that is pre-planned, and then some? How much of that is like, oh, I was just I just had a shot of my kids playing around in the playground, and then I I turned it into something. Sure. Well, in theory, like almost all of them have been um, like pre-planned is sort of the wrong word, but it'll just be that we're they'll be inspired in the moment, which is really cool. Like I'll see my kid doing a fun game. And having worked in the visual effects so long and knowing what kinds of things lend themselves well to visual effects, I'll see him jumping over a thing or playing with his boat on a playground and I'll think, oh, 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 I could totally do this thing. Go do the thing you just did again. And so they're rarely something I'm filming for the first time that they're not technically performing or I'm getting them to play the same game again. Like I think in that case it was we're outside the playground and I want to see how fast you can get to the steering wheel. And so like he runs around the boat to the side and I'm running behind him and it just turned into this great handheld kind of shot thing. So they're usually just inspired by the environment and what's going on around. And every now and then for some of our more commercial products, like th those are the only times where we'll sit down and script something out and, you know, write, figure out what's going to happen. But, um, I try to base them all in something the kid is enjoying doing. So when they repeat it, or if I have them do something for that, like use monkey bars to crawl over a, you know, a crocodile pit or something like that, I want them to be having fun with whatever that action is. And if it's not, it's not worth uh, diving into. If they start looking at me through the thing and Aww. doing the thing, I'm like, <laughs> okay, all right, we're good. That was, that was going to be my next question. It's like. Oh. Are the kids over it yet? Uh, it's they. It's funny. They truly go back and forth with stuff like this. Um, just yesterday, my son and my daughter went and filmed a horror movie trailer by themselves and edited it in iMovie, which was amazing. Um, they are allowing me to to license it from them to share on social media if I would like, um, which is this amazing new business plan that my son came up with, which is like, Dad, film me doing this thing and then send it to my phone and delete it from yours. Then if you want to license the clip from me to use in Action Movie Kid, you can pay me the uh, flat rate for it and you can- I love it. it. That's me. awesome. So, wow. so uh, he's gone from, you know, innocent three-year-old to, uh, you know, extorting nine-year-old. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's clever. It's been, it's been pretty amazing, but um yeah, depending on what type of project it is, the more fun they have, the more willing they are to do it. So if it's a project they don't understand um, why they're doing it, or it's just like a dad passion project, like, please do this for me, they, they can be a little bit over it. If they're having fun playing a game or in, in you know, they're really into Avatar The Last Airbender, 
right now. Me too. And uh, so we're going to uh, definitely be doing some stuff with that because they're very inspired by that, which is really fun. So that's cool. I loved that show as a kid and still as an adult. It is <laughs> outstanding animation from all of it. The, the actual like choreography and the topics they touch on and every, everything about that cartoon is out, outstanding. It's so great. I saw the M. Night movie before <laughs> I saw any of the animated series. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I actually made it through that whole movie. I, I stopped like 20 minutes in. I couldn't do it. Yeah. We actually watched it again with the kids. Like they'd finished the animated series. I watched about a third of it with them as they were watching through it. It's incredible. Um, and then we watched the live action movie with them. And like, it's fine that they, but it was just, but uh, there's a great pitch meeting on it um, by, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Ryan, um, Ryan George does a pitch meeting on YouTube about uh, Avatar, the M. Night version. It, it's, it's spot on. Oh, I'll have, to try, I'll have to try and find that. That sounds interesting. <laughs> Uh, I hear that Netflix is going to do a live action adaptation of the show. I heard, I saw that the headline was, and we promise not to screw it up. Yeah. Uh, which <laughs> I, I think they'd be okay with it. Yeah. I just, I seemed to laugh more. Like I didn't know I would laugh so much in, uh, in, in that series. And I love laughing with the kids. They'll laugh hysterically at some of the jokes and sight gags in that show. And yeah, the, we watched the movie through and like there was there is not, you know, there's hardly a chuckle. Yeah throughout it but uh you know you know they tried to cover a lot in that movie like i was watching it from the vfx standpoint going like they they pulled out all these stops it's just i have so much fun in like 10 minutes of the show and this uh this episode or this movie is uh interesting i'll get yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'll just hate to speak yell of the people trying really hard to do stuff yeah that's true <laughs> just yeah sure. Let's see. Let's see if there was any other questions from the audience or anything. Uh, I think we're all caught up there. Just there's a lot of talk about Jurassic Park and, and reminiscing on some of the the scenes <laughs> in there. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Jurassic Park got so many things right that uh, yeah, both from a, uh, I mean, it's Spielberg getting you you know into those characters really well, and uh, yeah, just those action sequences are so tight. Well, I don't want to like dive too much into like it being about us or anything like that, but I am kind of curious because you just recently got a system from us. I did. Um, mm. And so I am kind of curious, like what, what about your workflow like has changed uh, since getting a system from us? Like yeah. what impact has it had now? Yeah, one of the main effects is that I used to be very used to certain things that I would do and walk away from my computer for, like camera tracking a longer shot or doing photogrammetry solution, like calculating and even just rendering. And I wasn't doing super in-depth rendering, but I'd usually pre-render out anything I was doing in After Effects with Element. And I like to crank up Element to just unreasonable settings to try to get it to mimic, you know, what uh, you know, more robust program would do. And uh, I could choke my old computer doing that kind of stuff and I would walk away and I would still do overnight renders for even element layers. And now I'm working on the new system live a lot of the time with minimal lag at the same settings. I'm doing things, I'm just switching to another monitor for a moment while tasks complete. And it just makes, I'm often surprised that things are done because <laughs> I'm used to being able to walk away or to get a drink while they're happening and half the time they're done stunningly early and I'm wasting my own time, <laughs> which is- So really you're angry because you have fewer coffee breaks. I do have fewer coffee breaks. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so screw you guys. I, uh... <laughs> no, it's been really fun. I've, uh, my my old system was just, you know, it was years old and, uh, you know, for computer graphic kind of stuff, that's that can be really challenging for it. Um, oops, pardon me. And so, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, the computer was also very bloated with, uh, you know, the standard things your computer gets bloated with. And so it was really nice to be able to fresh start with a system that actually just worked. And uh, I'm able to install and run multiple programs. I'll be running 
a copy of everything I have on it right now, which is really cool. I'm not uh, choking it so far. So, uh, so far, you know, really, really great stuff just to have uh, so much brain behind uh, what I'm <laughs> trying to do. And we, so were you, so you primarily work from home, right? Yes. So okay. yeah, ever since I left DreamWorks, I've been effectively just working here. I haven't uh, worked in another physical workspace since. Okay, so like nothing really pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus are pretty much essentially the same for you then. Yes, the only difference is the uh, is the presence of children 24-7, which is uh, a little interesting. So there's never that, you know, like quiet school hours or something like that, which is sort of what my most of my work day ends up getting uh, scrunched into. So uh, having them around is fun. And uh, yeah, we're trying to take a look at it as just a really unique way to uh, get to spend extra time with them during these... <laughs> childhood years as we try to sort through uh the the very superb handling of uh of a complicated situation so yeah you can always read my twitter feed to hear my opinions on the uh on how we run <laughs> stuff i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's been fun so since since now you have this very robust, powerful system, is there is there a, something that you've kind of had in the back of your head that maybe you haven't been able to do that you're you're able to? Because these are the these are the kind of things that always get me super. Oh, stoked. Yeah, um, there's a um, it's funny. There's a short that I filmed with James years ago um, that I thought would be really fun to do, and we filmed them filmed most of it. But um, whenever I come up with an idea, it'll be like effect shot, effect shot, effect shot, effect shot. And it'll just become you know, prohibitively difficult to go through. You've got to camera track every single shot from it. You've got to do all these things. And I'm finding that suddenly I'm at a spot where I can bulk do a lot of these actions like camera tracking and rotoscoping, which would have been just, would have taken too much time to do before and now have both better software since when I started and better hardware to back up doing more challenging stuff with them. So it's been, I'm hoping to unlock doing more of that work, which would be really fun because I enjoy filming shorts with my kids, but because it's suddenly like, instead of one 10 second clip that I post online, it's, you know, 46 VFX shots and a bunch of editing and stuff like that in between is really hard to come by that free time in the one and a half days I uh, have free a week. So it's been oh, really nice cool. to know that uh, I can have my, yeah, my computer and Adobe with Sensei trying to figure out stuff that I would have had to do manually before. So uh, pretty awesome. That's something else too. Like uh, I know way, I think near, near the very beginning of all this was, was mentioned um, like the rotoscoping and, and content aware Phil. Uh, uh, constantly just uh, mind blown honestly of, of how it, how well it does actually I, I think I just saw a video of yours um, removing some statues and things um, yeah. <laughs> and and even still though like um, I, w I was shocked at like how well it filled in like the buildings behind like it, it knew that, that that's the corner of the building even though that it's not even in the shot anywhere and it was an, it's incredible that kind of stuff I mean, yeah, like I am, I'm looking forward to a day where, you know, machine learning does all of our rotoscoping for us, where like mildly approaching that on the After Effects level, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine that'll get better, but what I hope that does is it just frees up more people to do more creative work. I'm really excited to see what kids who are like, like when I was 20, I could, you know, I would stay up for weeks at a time just to get through things. And, and you have that kind of crazy energy and drive. So I'd love to see what the people who are growing up with these tools are going to be able to do. It's going to be mind blowing. Yeah, I think um, that's something that's been uh, Matt. He he's the one who really gets behind this into the the testing and benchmarking for all the Adobe Suite. Is something he's mentioned a lot too. Is that um, 
you know, there's this fear that AI is going to take people's jobs away and, and things like that. But um, he's he's always pressed on the on the side of it that like I th it's more that AI is going to free up time from a lot of that kind of mm -hmm. manual or or kind of tedious, redundant work. That like instead of having to manually select the thing you're trying to to remove or rotoscope out, it'll just it knows that that's the outline that you're trying to go for, and it it's it's three seconds and now it's perfect and yeah i think that's going to free up a lot more of that creativity so people can can just do more with without having to do so much manually absolutely and, it, and we're at a weird intersection now too where i'll see a common complaint that like my phone can like cut out my background and do all this stuff in real time and put a thing on my face and do stuff like that why am i not doing that on the on my computer and it's and i think yeah, I mean, there are just you know there are two paths that uh, that type of computing uh, took, and it's going to be really interesting when both when hardware ties those types of thinking together, and also eventually machine learning will overtake both of those too. So it's going to be really cool to see, uh, yeah, the scary fast computing of the future <laughs> and how it starts to affect and uh, help our work. I, d I just love that it's, I, I think of it as enabling more than anything because it's gonna be the stuff that I don't wanna do now. And if I had someone who could rotoscope all my stuff and camera track it all for me, I would happily welcome that into my life and then just drop in the effects in the end. It's so fun to do that part. So yeah, you'll be able to iterate faster. You'll be able to do all that kind of stuff more creatively, which is cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see Especially the amazing things that, like you were saying, people are doing with just their cell phones is is really really cool. Um, uh, let's see here. Absolutely. Uh, we got a bit more of a hardware question, Eric. Maybe you, maybe if you could, might be able to get this one, or or Matt, if you're still in the chat, um, regarding Adobe software GPU acceleration. How are AMD comparing to Nvidia? Nvidia is still the best, I think. <laughs> That's the, the short <laughs> answer to that. Um, yeah. Oh, Matt's, it looks like Matt's in the chat. He should be able to handle that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. And Blake Blake Rizzo is saying he kind of agrees where the, you know, Snapchat, Snapchat can do facial and body tracking really well. And, and like, how come a, I, AE can't can't do it? Not as well. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I mean, like everything that I've heard, like I've asked Adobe in the room with them, like, why can't we do that? And the standard answer just seems to be that the the way the camera's processing is like is optimized is just very different it's like saying why can't i have unreal engine doing my 3d rendering in the background that just because like that hardware platform is you know like a ps5 is going to be sold at a loss and has a really specific targeted type of video engine that doesn't have to be compatible with anything it doesn't have to be developed to be robust with any other direction than the one that it's moving in and that seems to be the answer that I get from them. I feel like there's still, you know, there's got to be a, uh, a way to break through and be able to uh, to bridge these two worlds, and then it'll eventually happen. Um, you know, we're close with the detailed face tracking, but but uh, you know, it's of course nothing close to real time. But uh, yeah, I think once Adobe unlocks, you know, multi-core processing and some things like that, which I mean, are, have, you know, been long time, you know, white whales of, uh, of that kind of software. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited for that. Uh, I continue to be excited for that, uh, as we all have for the last decade or so. So let's see, uh, our, I want to get into these moments, um, kind of, I either get really super nervous or I forget kind of where I was headed with things. Um, <laughs> let's see, there's no, Nothing else from the from the chat, um, Eric. Uh, I mean, I was just going to ask, like, are there are there any other upcoming like features in in software or anything like that that like you're just I know we can, we've kind of touched on a few, but like if there's anything just like you're really uh, eager and excited about, um, I'm really excited to play around with um, volume rendering and uh, VDB files, which. Um, yeah, if um, if anyone doesn't know, there there'll be like a a rendering effectively in three D of the arrangement of particles, and um, so you can do something like record an explosion that you can view from all angles, or a smoke wisp that you can view in all angles. And Andrew Kramer's been playing around with that, and there's some other softwares that are 
going to start introducing that into the compositing pipeline in a cool way. So I'm excited to figure out uh, what that's all about because uh, yeah, debris and destruction and things like that have been such a huge part of what I do day to day. It would be really neat sure. to have that kind of variety and, and control over things like that. Um, and at the same time, I've never learned to do any kind of volumetric simulating on my own, whether it's, you know, like liquid or fire or smoke and things are just such a wide um, array or like array of things that would be really fun to know how to do specifically so you can make your shot look the best possible. And 90% of the time I end up leaning on, well, my, I can find stock footage for that. I can find, you know, you know, production crate or action VFX has me completely covered for this explosion I need. And then if I composite it with super comp, I can make it look like it was there all along. And uh, it, yeah, it's pretty cool. So um, the efficiency you can work with when you draw on assets from production crate and action VFX can be really stunning. So I like doing that a lot these days. Mix and matching. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I love seeing some of the things you've done where um, either removing things from the scene. Um, I just watched one where um, your son crushes a uh, it's like a vending machine. And, oh yeah, and it, and then launches it into the sky, and then it comes crashing back down, and it takes a big chunk out of the sidewalk and things like that. It, uh -huh. That's that kind of thing is just because it, it looks it's pretty good. Like wow, you know. Um, it's yeah. I always love to think that like my quality has just got to be good enough that the first time you watched it on a phone, you're like, hey, that was cool, <laughs> and like you know, like you know, none of them stand up to scrutiny really, but um, they. Um, it's fun to be able to do stuff like that, and um, yeah, it's like. Uh, working with like that was a brand partner one like we were working with uh the show the gifted which was fun because i was asked early on if i could help them previs what their superpowers would look like on that show i ended up not <laughs> but um and then they were like hey do you want to promote it at least on your channel or something like that here's what it ended up looking like and so i got to do still work with them on the back end of doing something like that and uh yeah they had the practical vending machine that did some of that stuff and then we got to uh quickly put together a digital version of it. That was a weird turnaround because I think we filmed it on a Monday and had to post the final piece by that Thursday or something like that. And it was just wow. a, a lot of effects to put together in a short amount of time, <laughs> but um, wow. tried to think about what we were going to do as much as we could based on what I knew it was going to be when we arrived there. And my son is sick for that one too. So like the guy is acting his heart out, but I felt oh. so bad he was... <laughs> like sniffly sick and I just felt like the most horrible dad ever just being like can you get through this I'll uh <laughs> we'll get ice cream Aww. but uh yeah it's fun it's really interesting working so closely with my family I mean my wife came from you know like I met her at DreamWorks she's always been in the art department doing stuff and she's a writer as well and then my kids I've turned like I've, I've become a stage parent which I did <laughs> wasn't something that I ever planned to do to any degree, but it's really interesting how much their performing became part of uh, our livelihood. And uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting way to spend time with each other. Yeah. I mean, either way, it's like a really cool bonding experience yeah, too. It's so. super cool. It is. It looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, like I just need to get through the like, they'll be like, you know, 10 years where they're embarrassed about the stuff they did as kids. <laughs> and then they'll come out on the other end and be like, no, that was kind of all right. So I'm, I'm looking forward to both you know, those waves. So, but yeah, now they're they're very interested in coming up with their own ideas and filming them, which is awesome. I, I, I would love to enable them doing that kind of work as much as they can. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll post that horror trailer uh, online soon it's it's great my son did the like text <laughs> and movie for, for it <laughs> That's so um, cool. but very amazing seeing especially yeah like just even as a parent it's really interesting seeing when like as a little kid you influence uh, you know you influence your little kids with like showing them the same stuff that you liked and you like you want this baby version of you and then it's cool when they like things that you like and it's really interesting when they like something that you have no idea about and you just realize you've got like, I've got to embrace this. Like I've got to like run with, you know, like we're like they're going in a direction that is good as them. 
And so it's uh, it's really unique when you get to see your kid being themselves for the first time. And I just uh, yeah, I hope I oh, that's get cool. plenty of stuff wrong, but it'll be cool to see what I can get right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's really cool. That is... That's really cool. So we do have one more question from the chat from uh, Steve Pratt. He says, uh, "Hashi, awesome. uh, have you ever created 3D characters of your kids?" Hey, um, remarkably, I have never done 3D versions of James or Sophia for anything, which has been so weird because I've gotten close to like knowing how easy it would be to do to pull off a certain effect or something like that. But so far, if they're in any of the the scenes, it's them doing stuff. Um, I'm working on a project now where I'm doing a ton of digital doubles, which is interesting. And so um, I'm, I mean, there it's like, it's the same, it's like action movie kid quality digital doubles. So like enough that you can just do something a little bit pushed and a little bit more animated for um, what a human can do, which is kind of fun. And I'm hoping that this learning process gives me some good feedback over what I'm good at doing or not, and then eventually get to apply this to the kids so I can do some cool stuff with them. I mean, not to replace them, <laughs> not that replacing them digitally is, is, is a long time goal, but it would be, uh, yeah, certainly could have made some of the other ones easier from the Roto standpoint. If I could, uh, you know, have them like face away from camera and become all digital and do something cool. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, not not ever done that yet. That'll be fun. It'll be fun to see uh, how that works out for you going in the future. Yes. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. And again, it just it's only because uh, I was using Make Human to do the to do my digital doubles. Um, so yeah, I learned about those from uh, Caleb Natal, who was who's done some amazing stuff on Twitter. And uh, yeah, he I was just chatting with him, and he said, "I used this. It was awesome. I got to. I just, you just it has all these dials and stuff." And so. Yeah, I tried it out for this uh, for a project I'm working on right now, and it's it's a pretty cool little program. For uh, I used to use um, Poser uh, by like, it was by a bunch of people. The company kept on getting bought by people, but like Meta Creations <laughs> maybe, or uh, I don't remember who ended up owning it. But I used to have a copy of that on my computer for a really long time because it was just you know basic humans. You could kind of pose and do stuff. I did my Alien short. Uh, the, our aliens parody using yeah. poser to animate the character on top of my friend in a green screen suit which oh, is kind man. of fun yeah awesome. but uh, yeah somewhere online i have the side by side of the alien short with and without digital effects and it's uh one of the most robust uh, overhauls that we've done in a short format mm. oh neat cool yeah, we did uh we did have one last question from uh from ben uh, asking about, is it weird that random people know your kids? It is weird that random people know my kids. Um, what's, uh, like, luckily we've tried to do our best for, you know, like maintaining whatever sense of privacy we can in our personal lives right. regarding all that. And, you know, we're not like crazy known, which is kind of nice. Um, so luckily you know if we're at like a convention we'll get recognized by a lot of people but if we're just like at the store we don't so it's uh sure. so that's kind of nice so but it is weird and it is um it started a lot of conversations with us internally and with the kids all about exposure and what they're comfortable with and that's cool. um having permission to post videos of them now is a really distinct interaction we have whether it's just a funny picture you want to post uh, to Instagram because they were playing a fun game or something, but um, yeah, the yeah consent to be put out there into the world uh, is something that we that have, is really uh, cool had to make a pretty big thing of, just because that's yeah. that's something I've always thought about myself too. It's like, what are you know we're growing up in a time now where we're posting all these pictures of our kids online. Like, what's twenty years from now? Yeah, they gonna think about that? You know, what are they gonna think about all those pictures that were put out into the world of them? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is really cool that you have those conversations yeah and if they've ever wanted us to not share something we don't and it's and it's uh it'll be you know like as a dad who may have just you know, like spent 20 hours rotoing and i might be like <laughs> <laughs> are you sure <laughs> <laughs> but i'm like you know if it's embarrassing i'm sorry yeah i won't i won't do it <laughs> no but that's that's really cool and I, I feel like that's that's a conversation that um a needs to happen more often especially as 
um, you know, YouTuber. You see a lot of the, you know, YouTube families and things like that, and mm -hmm. um, and and just in general, like you know, maybe maybe just having that sort of um, autonomy for your kids is, is for really sure. Cool. Yeah, and like I love it because hopefully, as it evolves, I mean, like action movie kid won't last forever, but well like me having fun doing stupid videos like that with my kids will go on forever. That's just my, in my DNA. So uh, I, I'm excited to see how that evolves over time. I love hearing my daughter like say, here, film me doing this. And then you add a thing here and it'll do a thing. And it's really cool to see just her like knowing like you can, you just delete me from this part and then put a, put this thing in here. And so I try to make those happen whenever I can because it's so adorable. But, that uh, is really cool because it shows kind of a like an understanding of uh -huh. like what it is that you're able to do. Certainly, yeah. All right, we'll do one one final question, and I think do this it. is a good one to to wrap up with. What was one of the most challenging shots you've done? Hmm. Let's see. I remember spending an insane amount of time on a portal video that we did which was early on and I felt bad because I'd never played portal before. So <laughs> I knew the gist, but I didn't know the pure mechanics. And I also didn't know that, that portals were oval, not circular, mm -hmm. but um, it was this shot we filmed on the DreamWorks campus actually, um, where James has a portal gun and he shoots it at the wall and then falls, you know, shoots it below himself to fall through the wall and into this you know, little infinite circle loop kind of thing. And at the time I'm using all of these really bizarre effects to simulate the different angles of, you know, seeing through the portal into the other one and seeing him fall through that and seeing through the secondary portal, what you would see behind that, trying to get my brain around that was really absurd. Also to try to figure out how something would animate through and around that because it also involved you know the entire time that james is falling through the portal he had to be rotoscoped out um from in front of like a plain wall i didn't have a green screen there to film him or anything like that so um i think he shoots it at the ground and then i run in and pick him up and i'm just kind of holding him in front of the screen <laughs> and doing a bunch of stuff and uh it turned into this uh longer piece but it required you know like erasing me putting in new stuff and so many little absurdly dumb things for such a you know short shot, but I really like the way it turned out after all that. Oh, so that's cool. Um, nice. Yeah, I'll list that one as one of the harder ones. All right. Well, all right. I think I think that's that's a, a good place to end it. We're a little over an hour here, and so um, we'll say we'll say thank you. And again, and I, I'm I'm. I feel like I feel like I kind of geeked out a little bit. I, it was really neat to be able to talk with you because well, you know, totally, like, this was fun, you guys. You know, knowing, having seen some of your early, early work, and then like oh, I get to talk with you, who actually did it, it's really <laughs> cool. Um, and so, thank you, thank you so much for for taking time out of your day to join us for for our workflow Wednesday. No, absolutely, thank you guys so much. And yeah, I'm excited to yeah, I'll be sharing on all my platforms how my system is doing, which should be exciting because yeah, I want people to know about that too. Yeah. That'll be great. Very so, excited for that. Um, is there anything you want to plug or shout out or anything right here at the end? Um, yeah, if you ever if you ever have questions for me, find me on Twitter. I'll 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 see your questions. DMs are open. All that good stuff. And um, yeah, Action Movie Kid on Twitter. And then um, yeah, check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to Action Movie Kids and watch Cheap Tricks on RedGiant.com. Right on. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and uh, and for all of you in the audience. Thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we do this sort of thing every Wednesday and Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, Wednesdays are our workflow Wednesdays where we bring industry experts on to, uh, you know, just chat and talk about their their particular expertise. And then on Fridays, we have a member of our labs team join us um, for more of the hardware software crossover sort of uh, information. And so, um, you know, the standard like, sub, subscribe, all that good jazz to our channel as well. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys next time.